Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihao, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moni Muli Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so grateful that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to join us by subscribing on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. We are really excited. Our guest today is Jane Yolen. She is here to celebrate Bear Outside. She's an author of over 400 children's books. Before we invite Jane to join us, we want to invite you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. When you go there, you can sign up for our newsletter. You can visit our certified great reads wall of fame. Find the next great book to add to your family library. You can learn about our live events and our live virtual events. So much information there. And, of course, if you are an author, you can find out about our author services. It's all available at readingwithyourkids.com. Join us right now from Western Massachusetts. You're not going to believe it. Our guest today is celebrating the publication of her 400th book. Please welcome to the show, Jane Yolen. Jane, how are you? I am fine. I am glad to be here uh, and to talk to people, I suppose, everywhere. But you're from Massachusetts. I'm from Massachusetts. So we're giving them a little Massachusetts love here. That's right. That's right. And and it's it's the rumors are not true. Uh, I live right in Boston. And I know people say that anybody living in Boston, they think that anything, anything beyond Route 128 is like the West Coast. I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I embrace all of my Massachusetts neighbors. And Western Massachusetts, if you if, if you don't know anything about the state, Western Massachusetts is beautiful. The Berkshire Mountains are a- absolutely spectacular. And, uh, and it's only a, a couple of hours away from downtown Boston, but you feel like you're in a, in a different world. I not only feel like it, I think I am. <laughs> We, I live about a block and a half from the Connecticut River, which means I can go for long walks along, you know, with my field glasses, uh, looking for birds. I can look out my back window in, in, uh, I live on an old farm. I don't farm it, but it, once upon a time it was a farm and I can see deer and I can see bears and I can see bobcats and I can see rabbits and coyotes and foxes and opossums and you name it. They're out there. It's like living in the wild kingdom. Ah, it's wonderful. And, you know, you mentioned that you can see bears looking out your back window. I'm imagining that that's kind of where the inspiration for book number 400 came from. The name of the book is Bear Outside. You were kind of sharing us a little bit about that, about how that book came to be. Can you can you share with our audience? Yes. Well, it, it's it's a sort of a double bear mm-hmm. bear story. Um, I was working at that point on another bear book called "A Bear Sat on My Porch Today" because that had actually happened. Um, I was away in Scotland, and my granddaughter, who was house sitting for me, sent me a note that said, "Nana." A bear sat on your porch today and wouldn't go away. And I wrote her back and I said, and you have given me a picture book idea. And I wrote that one. And I was helping the editor find um, illustrators who uh, lived in New England, uh, hopefully, because it was a New England story. Um, and um, and uh uh, so I was looking, I was looking on, online. I was, I was looking through, through other books and I came upon a woman whose work I didn't know named Jen Carace. And her work was wonderful, but it didn't, it wasn't quite right for the bear sitting on my porch book. It was, it was not outrageously funny. It mm-hmm. was, it was really elegant and wonderful. Um, but I sent it to him anyway and he said, no, no. He had found someone in Portland who would be perfect for the book. And I said, oh, Portland, 
you know, Portland, Maine. Mm -hmm. He said, no, Portland, Oregon. (laughs) (laughs) So I kept the picture of this little girl looking out the bear's mouth, looking empowered rather than scared. And I thought, there's a story there. I just don't know what the story is. And about four years later, I figured it out. Sometimes a story takes a long time. Sometimes it's right there at Mm -hmm. the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Is that part of of the key to be able to write 400 books is that you – you have ideas, and, and, and if they're not coming, if the story doesn't come to you at that moment, you file that idea away and keep coming back to it until the story emerges? That's, that's part of it. The other part of it is I call paying attention. Ah. I think that ideas are everywhere. And when I teach writing picture books, which I do often with my daughter, I'll take the students out, um, and I will say, uh, we'll walk in the back in the back of of our property. And I will say, if you don't come back in half an hour with 10 ideas, you're not working hard, you know? And and so, so when I was showing them how you do it, I said, oh, look, here's a little stone that's sitting up on top of a, of a fence post. How did it get there? Uh, did an animal bring it there? Did a bird bring it there? Um, did an elf bring it there? There are three different three different ideas or I, I don't know where they're going mm-hmm. but those that's the start of an idea so I, I don't think it's the idea it's what you do with the idea because mm-hmm. if I had given the idea of the girls inside the bear to Maurice Sendak mm-hmm. to Paula and to Shel Silverstein we'd all come up with a different book. So the idea would be the same, but the books would be entirely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us a a little bit more about Bear Outside uh, and about this little girl who's looking out the mouth of a bear. Well, when you look at the the picture that's on Jen's uh, website, it's a picture of of a girl and the bear. Bear looks as startled as as the girl does. But but it's a darker picture than I was wanting to put into the book. I wanted to write a book about girl empowerment, really. And this is a child who has found her own way. She has, which is clearly um, a um, an invisible friend who is a bear, who she wears like a suit of armor. And she everywhere she goes, she feels... She can do this. I can do this. I can do that. I, 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 I'm feeling powerful and I'm feeling safe and I'm feeling that anything I want to do, I can now do. And it's the story of a day in her life. That's and in the very end, she and Bear go to sleep. And I won't spoil it for you. Well, that's but, beautiful. I'm, I, I love that image and, and, of a girl who just knows that she can do anything and has that confidence. And that is certainly something that I try to uh, help my daughter discover in her life. And I think in, in hopefully in some ways she has. She's a, a, a wonderful, accomplished young woman right now. How do you think parents who, who are listening to this, who are reading Bear Outside with their kids, how do you think that we can – help instill that that confidence, that empowerment in our young daughters, especially? Well, I have to, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this book, not only because it's the 400, but why this book? Why now? Mm -hmm. People see me, I can stand on a stage with a thousand people in front of me and give a speech and I'm not afraid. Put me in a cocktail party. And I go into the other room and sit down and read a book mm-hmm. because I'm not good at small talk. And if I had a bear that could help me with my small talk, I would be really happy. <laughs> or if I had a bear that would help me understand that that snake that just went across in front of me is is uh, not going to hurt me, you know, that would be helpful too. And what I realized was we all have different methods of trying to 
empower ourselves, much less our children. And and um, there is no one suit of armor that fits all. And and helping your child may be, may come with a story like mine. May come with you. Um, uh, I remember my daughter is as afraid of snakes as I am. It just comes in the family. And she was walking. We were walking along with with uh, my husband, her father. And, and, and her little girl who was three years old, we were out in, in, you know, a a gorge in Western Mass. And, um, the little girl, her name is Madison, was a little, a little nervous and a little excited because she loved going on these adventures. Um, but Heidi was thinking to herself, if the snake comes by, I'll probably end up throwing my daughter in front of me. And her daughter was a little bothered with bugs as well. And suddenly a snake came in front of Heidi and she picked up her daughter, put it on her, on her back and walked the other way. And then she said to her daughter, you can only be afraid of one thing at a time. Mm. You can't have two things. You're afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of snakes. Fine. You can't be afraid of bugs anymore. And the kid said, okay. <laughs> and that was it. She wasn't afraid of bugs anymore. Um, I'm not sure I could have ever said that to Heidi Mm -hmm. about snakes. I'm not sure I would not have just thrown her into the, you know, we, we have to pick our fights. Mm -hmm. We have to pick our fears. And I think if we fear everything, then we, we can't get on in the world. So my fear are snakes and cocktail parties. What are your fears? Wow. You, you know, I can absolutely relate to that fear of the cocktail party because I, too, can walk out in front of a thousand people. And it's the easiest thing in the world to to do after performing for 30 years. And it feels it's the place I feel most comfortable. Um, I, I, I don't quite walk into the other room with a book, but I'm, I'm not great, again, with the, the small talk one on one with strangers. Um, it uh, th- that small talk bores me more than <laughs> anything else um it, i just don't find it interesting I, I i think you know um being afraid uh you know i fearing that something can happen to somebody i love i guess is you know something that that keeps me up at, at night and how can i you know what can i do to make sure that my daughter is safe who lives down in baltimore what can i do to make sure that my son and his wife are safe and who lives in central massachusetts what can i do to make sure that my 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 beautiful wife is safe as she goes in to teach in person in the days of of the coronavirus uh, those are the things that scare me i think yeah and 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 we have to learn to man- we have to learn to maneuver around them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to learn um I'll, I'll tell you a little story. When my husband was very ill with cancer, um, and he wanted to go, we have a house in Scotland, and he wanted to go to Scotland. He wanted to go to watch Tiger Woods at the, at the, uh, the big, mm-hmm. uh, golf tournament. And I said, no, 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 you have to, you have to start, you have to start your treatment. You have to start your new treatment. This was after, after five years that the cancer had come back. And I, you, you can't do it. You can't do it. And my daughter said to me very smartly, she said, let him live. Mm-hmm. You know, let him go. He knows he's not going to see, see Scotland again. This is his only chance. It's someplace he loves. He is part Scottish and mm-hmm. he loves it. And reluctantly, I put on my bear suit and let him go. And, and it was a moment for him. Where he was still him, mm-hmm. you know? and and I think we can't keep everyone safe. I guess the, the 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 irony of wanting to keep everyone safe is you're not going to be able to. Mm-hmm. You can keep them safe for a while. You can say keep them safe when they're here, but maybe not there. So, how do we be brave, and how do we show them to be brave? Is we have to make it up as we go along. Yeah. That's a that's a good point. We have to make things up as as we go along. I think that's something that 
that a lot of people are that's something a lot of people are afraid of they're they're concerned that you know if i don't have this if i don't have this journey all perfectly mapped out where i know exactly where i'm going to stop and where i'm going to turn i i can't take the first step yeah 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 i think i think there's a, another thing my family and i love to go on what we call serendipity trips and we would we would have a general idea of where we were going. We were mm-hmm. going to go either east, west, north, or south. We, if, if we were going to stay overnight, we knew where we were going to stay overnight. But along the way, anyone in the car could say, I like that road. Or there's a dinosaur museum. Let's go there. Or can we go down that, that, uh, into that gorge? Or can we, can we stop and have a picnic here? You know, and all the, all three of the children, had that, they knew they could do that because mommy and daddy were there and we were all together. Mm-hmm. And I think that that if you are willing to have some experiences, you know, and sometimes, sometimes they can be scary. Um, my husband died 15 years ago and I have remarried um, now, finally 15 years later. And, and um, we were walking over to my daughter's house, which is next door. And as we came down the driveway, because we don't go down, there's a, there's a pathway down from my house to hers. My house is above, we're both on the same farm, farmland. Um, but she's down and I'm, I'm up on, on the hill, hillside. We don't go on that pathway during the spring, summer and fall because it's the bear's pathway. Ah. So we're very careful not to do that. Because you don't want to be caught on that 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 little rocky pathway when a bear might come by. Mm-hmm. So Peter and I um, are walking down the sidewalk, and we turn into her driveway, which is the very next driveway. And we're walking along, we hear a rustling, and a bear comes right in front of us. Oh my goodness! We were being so careful <laughs> about not going down the bear hot, the, you know, the bear route. route. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we were so, totally surprised by a bear. He was so surprised by us that he made a turn away from us and ran off. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment once we stopped shaking. Mm-hmm. It was a wonderful moment because we had been that close to a wild bear. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I can't. <laughs> I think the closest I've come is had one run past the front of my car <laughs> at night, and that was pretty frightening. <sighs> I, you know, I love, I, I love the spirit of, of what you're saying. Um, and it's something that I know my daughter, um, and I both embrace. And she, she, because of, of, of the, the wonderful high school that she went to, she was able to come out and tour, go on tour with me when I was performing, um, through, and, and we would be on the road for three weeks at a time. And, um, yeah, you know, you wouldn't know where you were necessarily where you're going. You had a destination, you had a name of a school, but you didn't know anything about the town you were showing up in. And um, th- we had lots of wild adventures. And um, anytime we found ourselves kind of in the middle of it and not knowing when we were going to get out of it and how we were going to get out of it and how the story was going to end, we would just turn to each other and say, this is going to make for a good story later on. You know what? You know what disaster is? Now, you know what adventure is? It's disaster averted. Disaster averted. So it's most of us have mini disasters all the time. Mm-hmm. The stove won't work. The toilet doesn't work. The uh, you nearly step on a bear or a snake. Um, a bird goes past you and drops its whatever on you. Um, but these make these make great stories later. Yeah, yep. and that you, it wasn't a total disaster. It was a disaster averted. Mm-hmm. You know, the bear didn't eat you. The bird didn't cover you with whatever. And 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 uh, you can talk about this and tell it at at you know the latest dinner party you're having with your friends. Mm-hmm. It, it'll give you some ammunition at that cocktail party that you're so afraid of. Well, you know, at cocktail parties, people come up to me and say, "So, are you still writing?" <laughs> <laughs> I answer for that. I want to, you know, want to say to them, "Are you still breathing?" 
I, you know, it's, this is going to sound like a silly question, but did you, did you ever envision when you first took pen to paper that, you know, you'd be here celebrating your 400th book? It's, it's, it's harder for me to believe I'm 82 <laughs> than it is because <laughs> two, three years ago, we celebrated my 365th and 366th book, books, which were published on the same day. The editor, two editors are still arguing over who had the 365th book. <laughs> and, and, and we called it, we called it, um, uh, read a Jane Yolen book every day of the year, including leap year. Ah, perfect. And we had a big, we had a, big party at the Eric Carl Museum and there were teachers and librarians and cousins and family and neighbors and friends and it was wonderful. And I thought that was it. And then I the next day or two I, I I looked through my list of I have lists, you know, of sold books, of unsold books, of almost sold books, of <laughs> books I'm writing, of books I want to write. Um and I realized that I had thirty Books that were already sold, I just hadn't been brought out yet. Mm -hmm. So, all right, 365 and you add 30 books. You got to hit 400 at that point. Territory very quickly. <laughs> and so the 400th didn't surprise me so much. It surprised me how quickly I got there. Oh, wow. Oh. Uh, but, you know, are there people, I'm sure there are people who have written more books. Mm -hmm. Um there was some woman a number of years ago in Spain who had written something over a thousand books, but they were mostly these little like three pages uh -huh. of, you know, if you wanted to, if you want to look at, at line length or at, at uh, words written, then you, then you look at some of the great novelists of the 19th century whose <laughs> novels were this big, you know. I wrote more words than I have with my 400 books. Yeah. But, you know, you're, you're telling 400 different stories. And, oh. and, and I think that's a, that's a little bit different. Both are big, huge accomplishments, but it's, a li it's different than telling one story with 100,000 words. You know what? It's more than four. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more than 400 individual stories because I have story collections. Ah. And I have poetry collections, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I know we have a lot of authors who, who listen to the, the, the podcast, and, and I know they're especially going to be interested in this one. Um, and, and I just want to go back quick. How do you train yourself? You, you were telling us how, you know, you're, you're able to find these ideas by paying attention and, yeah. uh, you know, being aware of everything around you. And I think that that's a great lesson that, that we can – learn as authors, but I also think it's a great lesson that we can teach our kids too, just to be aware of, of what's going on around them. And, and I think it's especially needed nowadays where kids are doing this. They're just looking at a screen. What, how, are there any exercises that, that you can suggest that will help uh, authors that can help kids just become more aware of everything that is surrounding them? Um, I think the first thing to do is to remember, again, that word, pay, you know, that phrase, pay attention. Um, too many of us walk through, you know, say, say if I walk down, I'm, I'm, I'm probably about five or six houses down from our post office. And it's easy just to walk down there and walk back and not notice anything. And you have to train yourself to notice, mm -hmm. pay attention to stuff. Because if I'm walking down there and I see some boys playing basketball along the way, you know, there's a story there. Mm -hmm. If I see um, two hawks flying overhead, are they mother and child? Are they, are they a pair? Um, are they hungry? Have they just devoured something? There's a story there. Um, if I look, uh, out and I see a neighbor's 
on the neighbor's porch, a bear sleeping on the porch, which somebody will have seen a, when my bear mm-hmm. slept on the porch. There's a story there. It may be the bear's story. It may be the person's story who lives in the house and wants to get out of her house or get into her house. Uh, it may be um, in rhyme. It may be in prose. There are so many choices that if you don't pay attention, um, you won't see them or you'll be overwhelmed by the number of choices you have. So you have to be both paying attention and having some kind of almost a ritual of dealing with all those stories you come back to your house with. It's a little bit like triage, you know, in, in, um, that's a word that comes, I think, mostly out of, um, out of, uh, war situations mm-hmm. where they were, they, they, they had their wounded, mm-hmm. they had to look and quickly decide, these are, these are savable, these may be savable, and these are dead on arrival. Ideas are like that too. Hmm. You know, I get back home and I'm looking at the various ideas and the various ways of looking at this or that idea. And I go, that's a really good idea. And I write it down. I, I, I make notes. Mm-hmm. Um, I may not write the, the story right then, but I make notes. Um, uh, another one I might say, um, I like this. Um, not sure what, quite what to do with it. Maybe if I did it with, my daughter Heidi or my son Adam or my son Jason or my, my husband or my, my best friend, uh, you know, maybe we can come up with something together. Or I may look at it and said, say, that one is DOA. Mm-hmm. That idea is DOA. The funny thing is sometimes a DOA will like, you know, a revenant come back to haunt you. <laughs> And you figure out what to do with it. Sometimes something that you thought was a slam dunk idea goes, oh, my God, there are three books that have just come out just like it. I mm. can't do the book. So it's a question of first paying attention and then second, figuring out triage, mm-hmm. um, which ideas you want to work on now, which ones you put away in the folder for later or never. Um, but I have folders full of ideas that I haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that when I die, my children, two of whom are professional writers and one of whom is a professional photographer, but he also writes, um, is uh, uh, they're going to look through those ideas and some of them, you know, Adam or Heidi or Jason are going to say, I want that one. (laughs) I can do something with that one. That's so neat. What a legacy! What what you know? What a what a great inheritance for your kids. Yeah, and two of the grandchildren are already one has already sold two books. <laughs> one one uh, we're working on. That's wonderful. Um, he wants to get an MFA in in writing. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll. See. Yeah. I'm wondering as you were talking about triaging the, the different ideas. Have you ever had a situation where you thought of a, a, a story or a character and you, you saw them going in, in one direction and that was going to be its own book and then it didn't quite work out, but, but that character or that situation found its way into another book with another character that you never thought of combining? Well, I'm not going to say yes and I'm not going to say no because nothing springs to mind, but I'm sure if I sat down and talked to Heidi, she said, She'll say, because she's my PA as well, she'll say, yeah, you did it with that one and that one. Because, <laughs> you know, if you have 400 books out, it's very likely that that did happen. Yeah, yeah. I sometimes, I sometimes realize, too, that I'm repeating myself. Um, repeating a phrase, mm-hmm. repeating a sentence, repeating an idea. Um, and And so I have to be more and more careful about that. When I was... Younger, I had so many ideas and they were all different because I was new. I was exploring. Now I'm re-exploring sometimes. Sometimes I'm rewriting an old book. Sometimes I'm adding to a series that hadn't been much of a series before. So uh, there are all kinds of ways to get to 400. Mm. 500. Yes. I'm looking at 500 now. 
Well, we we want you back to celebrate number 500, but we don't want you to wait until 500. You have a, a, a you know open invitation to come back to the show anytime. I, I want to take, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, and I apologize if, if it feels like you're being put on the spot, but we're recording this slightly after um, uh, the, the Dr. Seuss Foundation, another Massachusetts neighborhood, decided to not publish, uh, not, not to publish in the future, six, I think, six titles, uh, because some of the material in, in the books are offensive. When you're writing for so many years, you've written so many books, um, well, I guess one question is, uh, you know, what's your what's your thought on just the, uh, you know, people looking back at, at history and deciding, well, that classic is offensive. And so we need to not acknowledge we need to pretend that it didn't never came I, out. I don't think you pretend it never happened. I think you take it as a learning experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you. Goodness knows, you know, if, if, if you have a museum as Dr. Seuss has mm-hmm. here in Western Mass, if something is offensive, put a little plaque there and say, once upon a time when he was younger and he had done a lot of what we now would consider very offensive, um, uh, cartoons for the army during World War II, about the Japanese, Mm -hmm. sometimes black people. Um, But he changed as he moved through the centuries and learned himself. So let's look at the stuff he learned. I'll tell you, I probably have some early books I would never want reprinted for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't think being offensive is one of, you know, uh, racially offensive is one of them, but it might be, Mm -hmm. you know, um, but they're they're out of sync with the way we we think now. With they're out of sync with the way I think mm-hmm. now. I mean, I was I published my first book in 1963, and goodness knows that the world has changed, mm-hmm. that people have changed. I've changed mm-hmm. in all that time. I hope I've learned stuff. I hope I have um, have have used my time in the world, uh, to do good in the world. But perhaps in some of those early books, perhaps in some of the middle books, um, my thinking was, was entitled. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've led a really easy, interesting, um, uh, somewhat, um, sheltered existence, um, and 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 uh, you know those those things have to be acknowledged. I think that the Seuss group, um, who who were you know the holders of all of his of all of his works, made a difficult but important decision, um, and and they could have made the de- decision differently. Mm-hmm. They could have said we're going to keep these on, but we're going to change the words mm-hmm. or change the pictures. Uh, so that they are no longer offensive. They could have done that, I suppose. They, they would have been, people would have said, you can't choose, you know, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, they could have said, we're putting every single Dr. Seuss book out of existence because he was a bad man. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, he wasn't. Um, he was a compromised man. We're all compromised people. We all get stuff wrong over the years. Hopefully we get better at getting it right over the years, but I, I don't think that you could point to a perfect person. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, I include everybody in that. Yeah. Well, I certainly am not perfect, and um, but hopefully I'm learning and I'm growing. Even though I'm almost 100 years old, hopefully I'm growing and we're <laughs> learning every day and, and, and working to get better. Um and I think the, the only way we can get better is to acknowledge that we have flaws and that we th- we have things to work on. If if we think we're perfect, then we stop trying. Yeah, yeah. And I do. I have to say that one of I don't I don't know how famous um, really famous um, actors and actresses deal with it. Um, it's it's when fangirls or fanboys come up to you, and they absolutely love you, 
and they love your stuff and they think you're perfect and you go, you know, there's a mistake here. And I, I, don't do this because I'm not, you know, I'm not perfect. And it makes me uncomfortable if you say that. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, then I feel like I have to go back and take a good long soak in the tub and wash all of, all of the imperfections off. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This has been fascinating. I'm so glad that you spent this time with us today. We've been celebrating, um, the 400th book. That come from the from the mind of our guest Jane Yolen. The name of the book is Bear Outside. It's a great book to sit down and 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 to help your kids, especially your daughters, feel empowered to get out there and look at the world and know that they have uh, opportunities to do wonderful things with their lives. And we've had a wonderful time speaking with Jane Yolen. Jane, thank you so much for spending time with us today. My pleasure, fellow Massachusetts person. <laughs> Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest would be Dr. Beth Brown. She'll be here to celebrate Divot and Swish. Great, great children's book series. You don't want to miss it. want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Jane Yolen. Be sure to check out Bear Outside and all 400 of her wonderful children's books. I also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty. Fatima Khan, Alexia Brown, Hannah Pat Oboiski. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.